Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? As humans, we seem to be incredibly sensitive to the idea of symmetry. Uh, when we were in the jungle and we wanted to survive, uh, it was those that could spot symmetry that had a chance to realize that there was a tiger out there. If there's something with symmetry, it's likely to be an animal and either it's going to eat you or perhaps you could eat it. So nature has kind of programmed us to be incredibly sensitive to notice things with symmetry because they've got a message inside them very often. They're things that we should notice. Um, certainly many animals are very sensitive to symmetry. If you're in the garden, a bumblebee looks out for things with symmetry because it knows that that is likely to be sustenance. Uh, the flower in its turn needs the bee and so it needs to draw the bee to its uh, flower and so symmetry is acting a little bit like a language communicating between these two, the bee and the flower. And for us too, as humans, we use symmetry to communicate information. Um, I've got two faces here which I'm going to make artificially symmetrical. And I ask you, which of these do you find more beautiful? The first two or the second two that I've made artificially symmetrical. And most people are drawn to the second two. Why is it that humans find symmetry in a human face so beautiful? Well, again, this is communicating information. It's hard to make symmetry in nature. Um, so this is an indication that this person probably has a good genetic background, has been brought up well, is healthy, is going to make a good mate. So the symmetry is communicating to you information about the person that they'd probably be good to have children with. And Galileo certainly highlighted the fact that symmetry is a way of reading the world, of understanding um, the universe. He very famously wrote, the universe cannot be read until we have learnt the language and become familiar with the characters in which it is written. It is written in mathematical language and the letters are triangles, circles and other geometrical figures without which means it is humanly impossible to comprehend a single word. Certainly symmetry is very central to how we understand the scientific world, but it's also been very important to artists too, and many artists have talked about the, the role of symmetry in their work. Uh, this is um, uh, Pushkin who wrote in a letter um, that symmetry is a characteristic of the human mind, and it seems to be that we've been evolved to recognise symmetry. Um, Valéry, a French poet, wrote, the universe is built on a plan, the profound symmetry of which is somehow present in the inner structure of the intellect. And it's perhaps intriguing that both of these were drawn to a literary form that has a lot of symmetry at work in the creation of poems. But it's not always uh, such a happy relationship. Many artists find symmetry a little bit too controlling um, and a little bit um, an uneasy relationship. Here's Thomas Mann talking about symmetry in the Magic Mountain. He has a character describing the snowflakes that land on his arm. Uh, the character said he shuddered at its perfect precision, found it deathly, the very, very marrow of death. But for us as mathematicians, um, symmetry is far from deadly. It isn't still, it's something very active uh, and something with a lot of energy and movement in it. And the person who identified that symmetry is something with energy in it in some ways um, was a very romantic figure in the history of our subject, Everest Galois. Killed in a duel at the age of 20 over love and politics, but already while he was still in school at the age of 18, he'd come up with a new way of looking at symmetry, which revealed that it's full of motion and movement. So if you take a wall, for example, in the Alhambra, and you ask, what are the symmetries of this wall? For Galois and for mathematicians, this is about the movements that you can do to this figure, which makes it look like it was before you moved it. So if we trace an outline on the, this particular wall in the Alhambra, we can move these tiles by 90 degrees, and then they fit perfectly back on top of each other. And this, for someone like Galois, is the element of symmetry, the ways you can move something, transform it such it has a connection to where it came from, but it's evolved into something new. 
And this is an idea that one particular art form uses a lot to create an idea of movement, and that is music. In music, very often you're starting with a theme and you want to somehow mutate it and change it into something else which has a connection to where it's come from. And I think probably the musician who captured most the idea of using symmetry to generate interesting new ideas is Bach. Mitzler, Bach's student, once described Bach's music as the process of sounding mathematics. Now, as you came in, you were in fact listening to what I think is one of the pieces which is almost like a hymn to symmetry. It was the opening uh, aria of the Goldberg Variations. And for me, the Goldberg Variations is Bach really exploring the idea of symmetry in sound and music. So the Goldberg Variations, a piece for solo piano, starts with this aria, which is what you were listening to when you came in. And then Bach goes through 30 variations on this aria um, and then concludes with the same aria. Um, so already you have a sense of a circle that the thing joins up, the beginning and the end are exactly the same. Um, and to really reinforce this idea of a circular structure happening inside the Goldberg variations, if you move to the 16th variation, which is halfway through the piece, um, Bach intriguingly calls this an overture. Now, an overture in music is usually something which begins the piece. So already you're questioning where quite is the beginning of the Goldberg variations. Maybe you can start anywhere and join the whole thing up in this circle. Where Bach really plays with the idea of, of symmetry to create an idea of variation on the theme that we've heard in the aria is in every third variation. Every third variation in the Goldberg variations is something called a canon, which uh, you probably all remember from school. A canon is where one voice starts singing, and then a little bit later the second voice comes in and starts singing the same thing, but with a delay in time. And this creates a beautiful effect if you choose the right, um, the right tune. So every third variation is an example of a canon. So um, here's the third, first uh, canon, the third variation. Um, and so if you, I'm going to play a very short snippet of this, and you will hear um, the, the first uh, voice starting. It says starts on this B and does a nice little trill up, and then you'll hear the second voice coming in doing exactly the same thing. So let's hear the first canon that Bach has in the Goldberg Variations, and listen out for just the repeat of the pattern. This is like a pattern which is being repeated like a tile across a wall. There it is. There. Da -da 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 -da. So our, over the two bars, you had the, fir the first voice and the second bar came in with the second voice. But Bach isn't content with each new canon repeating this idea of just the second voice repeating what the first voice did. So he decides to take the pianist on a journey. So in the second canon, the sixth variation, the second voice doesn't just repeat what the first voice does, but starts, we've seen a shift in time um, uh, the sort of tile moving this way. Now we're going to hear a sif shift in pitch because the second voice starts one note higher in the third variation. So let's listen, listen out for this and you'll hear the, the G cascading down and then you'll hear one step up and A casting, cas cas cascading down. So each time you hear the first voice, but the second voice is one note higher. So as each new canon is introduced, this second voice climbs gradually higher and higher and higher, until something quite interesting happens when you get to the eighth variation, uh, the eighth canon, the 24th variation. Because at this point, this, the second voice has been stepping up one step at a time through the scale, and by eight notes, it actually hits something called the octave. We actually get to a note which sounds like the note you started with, but just an octave higher. So Bach kind of joins up this circle again. Um, in this case, actually, um, it isn't higher, but lower. So you'll hear um, the first voice start on a G and then an octave lower, in fact. So he, he varies quite where this uh, second voice is coming in. But you suddenly hit this point where suddenly the two themes join up again as if they're starting on the same note, but just an octave higher. So you heard the second voice come in there. 
But we've still got one more canon left, so where does this voice go on then? Well, in fact, it takes that next step upwards. Um, so uh, for me, when I hear this, uh, these canons, um, what I'm hearing is actually a kind of geometric shape embedded in here, because we've already heard the circle where we've had the aria starting and it joins up again with the aria at the end, but then these canons are creating a second worth of circles in this piece, or maybe even a spiral because you're getting this octave effect. Um, so embedded in this uh, um, uh, piece is somehow the shape of this torus, a circle's worth of circles. And as I said, the ninth variation continues this um, step upwards, as if you, it's telling you where the piece is going to go if you wanted to extend it off to infinity. And indeed, the first voice comes in, the second voice is an octave and a note, nine notes higher. <laughs> Now, Bach also uses ideas of symmetry to do these variations. So um, sometimes the second voice isn't a complete copy of the first voice, but actually has some symmetrical operation acting on it. So, for example, the first voice might um, uh, shoot upwards, and then you'll hear the second voice shooting downwards, as if there's been a reflection in the horizontal line through the music. Um, so here uh, we see um, uh, the, the note going, it goes down and then up and then down, but the second voice goes up, then down, and then up. Bach also likes to use a bit of symmetry at work in the rhythm structure of these canons as well. So um, if we go to, for example, let's go back to the 24th canon, um, he's broken up the beats in this bar into three beats, and each beat in turn is divided into three triplets. So we get a kind of th three lots of three in this structure. Um, so let's hear this one at work again. One, two, three, and one, two, three, 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 one, two, three. So Bach has some different combinations that he can do in all of these canons. Here we see a bar divided up into three and each beat divided up into three, but there are different possibilities. So we see Bach, the mathematician at work, who says, well, what are the other things I could do? So I could divide the bar up into four beats or two beats, and each beat I could do into triplets, semiquavers, or quavers. So he goes through all the different possibilities that you could have with these different ways of breaking up the rhythm. So this is a bit like having a combination lock where you've got three, uh, two triangles. One triangle is controlling how many beats are in the bar, two, three, or four. The other triangle is controlling um, how that beat is broken up into quavers, triplets, or semiquavers. Uh, Bach makes sure, as if he's trying to break this combination lock, um, that he ca covers every particular possibility. So how many different ways are there to arrange these three tri two triangles on, on, on my little combination lock? There are three times three, nine different ways. We had nine canons that we saw already. So indeed, Bach makes sure that each canon covers one of these different possibilities of the symmetries inside the different rhythms. So we've seen three, bro uh, three beats broken up into triplets. Um, for example, variation number 15, um, we see uh, two beats broken up into semiquavers. And I think this really illustrates that Bach is not doing this kind of um, unknowingly. I think that it'd be very hard to do this unknowingly. I think Bach is very aware that he wants to make sure that this structure covers all of the different possibilities. And there is so much structure in here. You've seen how the canons build up. They climb each time, the rhythms and things. But we've got one more canon that we haven't heard, which is the last variation, the 30th variation. So you might think, well, I know exactly what is going to happen now. It's going to take a step upwards again, perhaps um, start the rhythms again. But no, when Bach comes to this last variation, he destroys the structure completely. And this last variation is called a quadlibet, a musical joke. It's in fact just a variation on two folk themes of the day, has nothing to do with the rest of the structure of the piece, which is kind of curious, but I think it goes to illustrate how much structure has been up to that point that you find this suddenly the two folk tunes woven together so surprising. And 
this is not uncommon with artists. I think artists very often like this idea of setting up symmetrical expectations and then breaking them. Uh, one of my favorite examples, um, I work with a uh, professor in Japan, uh, 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 Professor Kurokawa, and we went to, he took me up to Nikko, and I took this photograph, it's of an arch as you um, enter the temples, and on the arch there's um, eight columns, uh, there's a beautiful pattern, symmetrical pattern on these eight columns. Um, seven of them are exactly the same, but the eighth one is turned upside down. And I, I said to Professor Kurokawa, wow, the, the architects must have been really angry, the builders, that they got this wrong and turned it upside down. And he said, no, this is a very deliberate act. Um, and he referred me to this wonderful um, Japanese Essays in Idleness um, from the 14th century. Wonderful book title. I, I need to write a book called that. Um, where the essayist wrote, in everything, uniformity is undesirable. Leaving something incomplete makes it interesting and gives one the feeling that there is room for growth. And I think that's what artists like doing. They like setting up this expectation and then breaking it. Um, uh, and in the Goldberg variations, that upside down uh, column is that 30th variation. Well, I guess if Bach is um, probably one of the, uh, the, the musicians who use symmetry a lot um, in the sort of classical period, in the modern period, probably the person who took up the mantle of using symmetry to do themes and variations is Schoenberg. Schoenberg's system that he introduced um, has symmetry at its heart to generate a palette of themes that he would then compose with. Um, what he would do, uh, he broke the kind of um, harmonic structure of the major minor scale, said every note of the chromatic scale, 12 notes should be considered um, as equal. Um, and they, you will then do some sort of variation of those 12 notes and arrange them in some interesting way. And then you would do symmetrical operations on these 12 notes. So this would be called a 12-tone row, which you would then uh, you would choose a 12-tone uh, row. That would be your kind of theme. And then you would do these variations on this in a very mathematical way. So the first variation is really to kind of push. If you think of this like a, a, a little tile, you would push the tile gradually higher and higher. So each note would be taken one semitone higher, and you might drop a, one down if it goes above the octave, and you would generate 12 12 different shifts of this particular motif, which all have pretty, pretty much the same shape, but it's just a different pitch. Um, so you've got 12 of those, so those would be uh, little translations, uh, but then you would do some more symmetrical moves. So you would do a reflection in the horizontal line. You would flip the thing upside down, just as Bach did, remember that, with that um, theme and variation. So Schoenberg would say you turn it, all the 12 upside down. But you can also vary them by playing them backwards. So he would re reverse them um, and, and do a reflection in the, um, so that was the horizontal line in the vertical line. And then he would combine those, which would be um, a, a combination which would be like a rotation. So then you would have 48 different themes from which you would then start your composition. And this was Schoenberg's kind of, uh, um, the, the way that um, he changed music at the beginning of the 20th century by using these symmetrical tools. And composers that were, followed Schoenberg's system were drawn to interesting 12-tone rows that when you made these symmetrical moves, perhaps interesting coincidences happened. Um, one of my favourite is Olivier Messiaen. Olivier Messiaen was very interested in the ideas of using mathematics quite intuitively very often in his music. Um, he used, he created some new scale structures based on symmetry, but he also was very intrigued by this um, system of Schoenberg's to use symmetry to create um, themes uh, and then vary them with these symmetry moves. But I particularly like one piece that he wrote for um, solo pa piano called Il de Faux Two, because in this particular piece, he chooses a 12-tone row which has huge mathematical significance for anybody who studies symmetry. Um, this 12-tone row, um, it's a little bit like taking, so you can think of the uh, notes a bit like 12 cards, a pack of 12 cards. And there's a way, so the notes will be arranged uh, from, say, uh, the ace through to the, uh, the queen, um, and, and those will be your chromatic notes, but then you want to make some new variation, some, some permutation of those notes. So what Messiaen was intrigued by was a particular permutation where you take 
the top and the bottom cards and put them on this hand. And then you would take the next top and bottom card and put them on top of this hand. And you would keep on doing this until you cleared this pack and you had rearranged the cards on this side. This is a particular shuffle called the Mongian shuffle. Um, and he used this, he said, well, that's interesting. I wonder what sort of music that will create. And so this is the, the, um, the Schoenberg 12-tone row that he uses in this piece, Ile de Faux II. And actually, he doesn't use the techniques that Schoenberg used, but he said, OK, well, I can repeat that shuffle. Um, so I can keep on, uh, I can take that uh, permutation, take it over to here, repeat the particular shuffle I've done, and that would be the next 12-tone row that you would hear. Um, so I think, have I got the piece of music? No, I think it's coming up. So this was the, this actually, as the piece goes on, you hear this shuffle being applied again and again to these 12 notes. This particular permutation for a mathematician is one that we recognize because um, one of the, Galois started this journey that we've been on for 150 years since he first introduced this new way to look at symmetry, which culminated um, in us being able to produce what we call kind of a periodic table of symmetry. It's called the Atlas of Finite Simple Groups. I brought it along here. Um, this uh, thing here is like the periodic table that the chemists have in the labs across the road. It lists all the kind of atoms of symmetry from which we can make all finite symmetries. Um, so um, there are some very simple symmetries, kind of shapes with a prime number of sides. There are symmetries which fall into kind of patterns. But then there are 26 very strange symmetrical objects that seem to have no pattern to them at all. We call them the sporadic simple groups. And some of the first to be discovered were by um, a mathematician called Matteo. And he, he discovered one which uses this permutation that Messiaen was using. And it, it creates this extraordinary um, symmetrical object. It's not an object I can show you. The first dimension that you will see this represented in, I think, is 11 dimensions. So uh, I can't show you this symmetrical object. But wonderfully, Messiaen has given away us a way to listen to it. So here's the sound of an 11-dimensional sporadic simple group. goes off into something else. But, but that was the first permutation that you were hearing um, of, of the, the set of uh, 12 cards, the 12 notes. Um, amazing that Messiaen was drawn to this for aesthetic reasons. He had no idea that this had a connection to a significant object for us as mathematicians um, with extraordinary symmetrical uh, implications. Another composer, the, one of my favourites from the 20th century, um, who was drawn to a, a symmetrical object that you can see, um, was uh, Yanis Zanarkis. He's a Greek composer who worked with Le Corbusier. He was an architect, but he was also fascinated in mathematics. He wrote a piece um, called Nomus Alpha, which he actually dedicates to three mathematicians, um, Galois included in them. And this is a piece for solo uh, cello. And he uses, again, a, the idea of symmetry to do a, a variations on, on a particular theme. So um, this is, uh, I think, have I got, yeah, so, so I'm going to play you the piece of, uh, uh, a little excerpt from Nomus Alpha. I want you to try and see what sort of symmetrical shape is conjured up in your mind's eye by this particular piece. You can open your eyes now. What did you see? Did you see a symmetrical shape, anybody? It sounded very asymmetrical, I think. In fact, uh, that was, in fact, a cube. Um, although it's, I, I find it quite hard to hear the cube. And, and, and it's a little bit unfair to only play you that amount of music, because you only start to hear the cube and its symmetries at work actually as the variations begin to build, because then you start to see some connection between the, the, the 
the piece of music you just heard and as it's varied. What's going on here is that um, Xenakis took the 24 rotations um, of the cube and what he did was to put musical ideas on the corners of that cube. So um, I think we've got them here. So, so the eight corners on, on the cube. So I actually had several cubes at work at the same time. Um, so uh, you see here S1 to S8. Um, so uh, this would describe the quality of the sound. So you heard lots of different things that the cello could do, a sort of pizzicato, glissandi, um, uh, and, and these are described by, by these particular shapes. Um, and then there'll be another cube keeping track of how long was spent on those particular elements and also how loud or soft they were being played. So he would read the corners of the cube and then compose with those restrictions. And then he would apply, apply a symmetry, so one of the symmetries that we've seen here, to the cube, and then the next variation would read off in a different order um, uh, the, the things that the cello would have to do. So you'd hear these, um, the, these things varying. So by actually the end of the piece, you've heard uh, a sequence of permutations at work, rotations, symmetries of the cube, and you hear, begin to hear some sort of interconnection between them. Um, there are 24 variations, but what I discovered just recently is that he isn't going through all the rotations. Um, he's actually produced a new structure, which I've never seen at work. I assume there are some group theorists here. They might tell me that this has been studied. But um, he actually uses a kind of Fibonacci rule to generate which symmetry is going to be used next in the next variation. So he explored, um, he took two symmetries of the cube, and then the third symmetry would be used would be the combination of those two symmetries. Then the fourth symmetry that would be used with a combination of the two previous ones. And what he did was to find which are the two symmetries which have the longest chain before it repeats itself. So he found a chain of 18 uh, kind of Fibonacci things which then returned to the beginning again. Um, so he had 18 variations and then he would pit between every third one another variation so, to bring us up to 24. So uh, this is one of the Beautiful things I find sometimes with working with uh, collaborations but cross disciplines between art and science that out of this perhaps comes a new question, is that an interesting structure for a, um, a, a, a mathematician to look at, the idea of a Fibonacci chain of uh, symmetries which I'm not sure I've ever seen studied. Um, uh, so Xenarchus is using the cube um, as a way of uh, generating those variations. Again, we see symmetry as a way of restricting the possibilities that he could do. He could have just done uh, eight factorial different ways of um, arranging those kind of sounds for the cello, but no, the cube restricts and constrains his creativity. And this is often why a composer will use mathematical structures in their work, because they have too much freedom and you can't create. This is Stravinsky talking about the importance for him of constraints coming from things like mathematics. My freedom consists in my moving within the narrow frame that I have assigned myself for each one of my undertakings. I shall go even further. My freedom will be so much the greater and more meaningful the more narrowly I limit my field of action and the more I surround myself with obstacles. So we've heard a lot um, about the way that composers have used symmetry as a way to create this framework within which to compose. But there's also something interesting working the other way because we've also discovered that within sound we can discover symmetry at work in creating that sound. Um, and this is what we've got set up here. It is a, a demonstration of, of how symmetry is embedded in just the nature of sound itself. And this is an experiment that was done at the beginning of the 18th, 19th century um, by uh, scientist Ernst Gladney who discovered that symmetry is actually um, hiding in the sounds that we hear. Um, he became very famous. He was kind of the Brian Cox of his day, going on tours around Europe, um, uh, giving uh, lectures about physics. Um, and he discovered that if you take um, a metal plate and you take a violin bow and you vibrate the bow and you put um, sand or salt or pollen on top of the bow, um, with careful uh, vibrations you can get 
some interesting kind of symmetrical patterns appearing in it. And, and he went around the courts of Europe. Um, um, he actually gave up his position at uh, university. He ma managed to make enough money doing this tour. Um, he went to Paris, um, where he demonstrated this uh, for Napoleon, who thought it was so extraordinary, he gave him 6,000 um, uh, francs for, to, for his demonstration. So what we thought we would do is to give you a kind of insight into the way symmetry appears um, in, in the vibration of a plate. So um, we've set up here um, on the front here um, an example of uh, Hladny's experiment at work. And um, uh, what we've done is a slight variation because we've chosen, uh, we put four plates together. So we're going to see how each plate will produce some symmetry and how these symmetries then build up. Um, to make perhaps something a little bit like the, um, the wall in the Alhambra. So now you've been given um, these uh, uh, earplugs, which are not because uh, in case you find the lecture so boring you wanted to go to sleep. They are in fact for this moment here, um, because what, uh, what we're going to do, uh, our Aaron at the front here is going to be operating and, and picking out particular frequencies of the vibrations of this plate, and we'll see the different shapes that are merging um, in, in the salt that are put on the plate. So you can now put these in. Um, and I will put mine in because I'm the closest. <laughs> Probably good that I do it. Yeah, yeah. So. Aaron's got his fancy ones. You see, he's got like I, I, I need to get some of those <laughs> rather than this. Okay, so we're going to uh, put the salt on. Um, and then as the frequencies, so what we've got underneath is amplifiers which are going to make the plates vibrate. So. Fantastic. Well, you can take them out now. <laughs> now, I must say, I found that magical the first time I saw this actually at work. Um, and uh, you, if you want, you can find this. This, is, this was a YouTube video, just in case that didn't work. Um, but uh, <laughs> But uh, Hladny documented all of these extraordinary different shapes, uh, some quite simple, but as the frequency gets larger. So what we have here is um, uh, um, a, a little speaker with a rod connected to the speaker, and the rod is um, uh, vibrating the plate. And we see these extraordinary patterns at work. So what is going on here? Um, uh, well, this is very similar to um, a kind of two-dimensional version, really, uh, of the discovery that Pythagoras made um, uh, m uh, thousands of years ago uh, that uh, music and mathematics are intimately related. Um, he discovered that the notes that we find harmonic um, a, a nice combined together um, have mathematics hiding behind them. And you can d demonstrate this uh, with a, a, a string. So if you vibrate a string, um, then you can vibrate it twice as fast. And we see uh, a point in the middle which doesn't move, something we call the node. Um, so this point is not moving at all. This is a note which is an octave higher. If we vibrate three times as fast, we see two points which don't move. And this is a note which is one perfect fifth. And this is the basis of musical harmony is the combination of these uh, second two notes at work. But the interesting thing for our Hladny plates um, uh, is that uh, what we're seeing here, the two points which don't move at all, um, uh, the, what we're seeing with the sand stabilizing is these are the, the lines in the plate which are not vibrating at all. They're the nodes. They're a bit like these stable points here. Um, so when we see all of these patterns um, at particular frequencies, there's a complete shift and change. We've picked out the particular frequencies. If we'd done it um, as a continuous frequency increasing, um, you would have seen a complete shift of the pattern from one to another as we um, hit each resonant frequency.
So the patterns you are seeing um, are the places where the plate is not vibrating. The challenge was, can you mathematically explain why you're seeing these and even predict for different shapes what sort of patterns um, will emerge, what, what sort of frequencies will you hear those patterns? Um, so, as I said, Napoleon um, heard this uh, lecture, was so excited about it, he said, this man makes sound visible. And it was at this time that uh, the Paris Academy, they used to like to set prizes, um, challenges, to try and uh, stimulate the mathematicians at the time. And they chose different sorts of um, challenges. And the, the, the one that was chosen, I think, in 1808 um, was to explain the, the, the patterns that were appearing in Chladni's plates. Chladni experimented, found these, but how can you predict uh, 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 what you'll see in these plates? The prize didn't get many entries. Um, the first entry, the two people entered, um, one was, uh, became um, a member of the academy and wasn't allowed to enter anymore because he became a judge. The other one was a certain Antoine Leblanc. And um, uh, this uh, was quite intriguing for the professors at the time because this student, Antoine Leblanc, had been a particularly bad student and then suddenly um, uh, was performing extremely well. And they were kind of intrigued. Well, how come this student has suddenly become incredibly good? Um, uh, the, the solution that was submitted was not um, uh, really uh, uh, worthy of the prize. But and then a second solution came in, um, at which point they decided to find out who this was. It turned out not to be Antoine Leblanc, who had left the university at the Ecole Polytechnique some time ago, um, but it was in fact a woman, Sophie Germain, who was using Antoine Leblanc's name because she couldn't study at the Ecole Polytechnique. Um, and so she'd assumed a man's name in order to be able to try and get access to um, the, the university. Her third submission for this prize um, uh, was under her own name, by which time she'd been outed, um, and it was a worthy enough contribution to the understanding of these plates uh, that she was awarded the prize. Um, it was the first time that a woman had won uh, this prize given by um, the Academy um, in Paris. The solution was not complete and it seems it might have had some mistakes in it, um, but Sophie Germain uh, is one of the things that she contributed. The other one is very relevant to this building here um, because she was one of the people who made uh, a significant contribution to the solution of Fermat's last theorem. Um, she was able to show particular equations of the form x to the p plus y to the p equals z to the p do not have solutions. Um, but the p had to be a special p prime such that also 2 times p plus 1 was also prime. These are now, so for example, 5, 2 times 5 plus 1 is 11, so that's a prime which we, with this method would work. These are now called the Sophie Germain primes. Um, but she also made a contribution to the first attempt to understand the mathematics behind these plates. But it wasn't until the beginning of the 20th century um, when Walter Ritz finally came up with a, a, a way to solve what was going on to be able to make predictions. He worked out what the frequencies were and they compared very well to the experimental frequencies at which these particular vibrations were appearing. Um, his work wasn't really recognised at the time, as I understand it. Um, Russians um, took his work and realised that it was very powerful. It now is, I think, the basis of the finite element method, which is used by many people solving PDEs. Um, uh, uh, Lord Raleigh kind of claimed that he'd stolen his ideas. Um, so I think it, it's, uh, it's right that we celebrate um, somebody who perhaps name isn't so much attached with these uh, plates as, as it should be. And he came up with this way of producing the particular um, uh, vibrations that give a prediction uh, uh, for the particular plates. Um, but this particular mathematics and the physics behind these plates um, isn't just relevant to understanding the vibrations that Chladni was producing in, in that uh, wonderful lecture that he gave in, across the courts in Europe. We now use the same sort of ideas across so many different disciplines that this um, uh, has a, a, an incredibly rich heritage, um, uh, the ideas that um, uh, came out of these plates. Um, so, for example, musical instruments, it's very important to understand the particular resonances that will happen in particular shapes. Um, why is a Stradivarius violin so much more valuable than a Yamaha manufactured, uh, factory manufactured violin? Um, some people believe it's the, the, the nature of the woods that's uh, made, uh, that the, the, the violin is made from. Um, but one of the things which is particularly relevant is the shape 
the perfection of the shape of that particular violin. And you can uh, analyse the particular Chladni patterns that appear in the, the violin box. Of course, you know, you've just got a, a string vibrating, so you might say, you know, what's so important? Surely the string is the most important thing. But it's these resonances that are, are produced in the violin, which are actually the characteristic of the violin it, uh, comes from these, these patterns that you see. Um, if you take a circular plate, uh, which is one that Chladni um, analysed, and it's actually mathematically the easier one to analyse, what you discover is that the first frequencies where these um, patterns appear uh, actually are very related to each other. They're in, uh, the first um, uh, frequency and the second frequency are in a two to three relationship, which is the perfect fifth from which we make musical harmony. The next frequency is in a, uh, so three to four, four to five, five to about 5.92, almost six, 5.92 to 6.9, I think, almost seven. So the first six frequencies that you hear of, the, of a circular plate vibrating are almost in whole number ratios to each other. And this is why if you have a timpani which has a, um, a circular shape to it, it has a note to it. You can hear a note because you're actually hearing the harmonics that you are hearing when a violin string is vibrating. Rather intriguingly, the note that you hear is not one of the notes that it's vibrating at because your ear is tricked into putting the bottom fundamental. So we've heard two to three to four to five to six, um, but actually your ear fills in and you hear the bottom one which isn't vibrating at all. Um, so certainly these flattening plates will be important for understanding um, the creation of musical instruments. But the same sort of idea, what is at heart here is discovering something called the eigenvalues. Um, th these are the frequencies of an operator controlling these vibrations. And the idea of an eigenvalue, some of you students here uh, from school may be studying matrices, and matrices have these things called eigenvalues attached to them. And they're, they're really at the heart of understanding many things across the physical world. So for example, in quantum physics, the idea of these particular vibrations um, of, of a particular operator, just since, as in here, we went through uh, a set number of variation, uh, frequencies which produce these patterns. In quantum physics as well, the particular frequencies which you get these energy levels at, it's how we understand how an atom is working. In particular, if you know, computers are getting smaller and smaller until we're hitting the quantum world. And what, very often what we're having to, ha to understand is a kind of small area where an electron is trapped. And we have to understand the resonances of that electron. Uh, and again, those particular waveforms that will control the quantum behavior of that electron in this little stadium um, will be very similar to the clad knee plates. Um, uh, and it's understanding the different frequencies which will give us an understanding of how that electron is behaving. But it's not just very small things like quantum physics. Um, I discovered that um, the understanding of earthquakes in Mexico, um, uh, a particular lake, um, if you look at this particular shape of that lake and understand the Chladni um, patterns that will appear in a, something of that shape, it helps you to understand the fault lines that are lying beneath that lake. And in uh, an area very close to my own, um, I study symmetry, but I'm also very interested in number theory and prime numbers. One of the ways we believe we can understand prime numbers is using something called the Riemann zeta function. And we believe the, way, the places where this function outputs zero are going to give us the understanding of how the primes are laid out. Um, it's a kind of landscape, and the points at sea level in this landscape are the DNA which will explain the primes. Um, we believe that these are also eigenvalues of something. They're resonances. They're like the moments in this Chladni plate where suddenly the shapes change from one to the other. If we can understand what that, that kind of thing is, whose frequencies are controlling the, these uh, po points at sea level, it might tell us about one of our biggest mysteries, namely understanding prime numbers. But we're using these particular plates, the idea of putting several of these together, because we were intrigued to, to use this as a way of perhaps generating some new patterns. Um, traditionally, Chladni plates are shown one at a time, and you see these wonderful symmetries appearing. But we were wondered what would happen if you put Chladni plates together with different frequencies um, operating on different plates. Sometimes the patterns seem to be asking to be propagated across um, the plates. And so 
um, our project, uh, this is our first experiment, your last kind of soft launch and kind of experimenting um, with this idea. Um, we're going to, uh, you might have seen as you, some of you when you came in, uh, we spent the afternoon with 16 of these plates um, uh, connected together in a 4x4 four four grid and we've been altering the frequencies and just seeing whether we can generate some new patterns. Um, and this is a collaboration with um, uh, 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 an artist, Richard Rees, who's here in the audience, um, who runs something called the Pattern Foundry and he's been curating uh, um, patterns by different artists and uh, patterns of his own. Um, we've created a pattern together, um, uh, this uh, second pattern along something we call a ghost tile. It's a little variation on, um, let's see you whether, uh, um, oh yes, I haven't got, it, it's a variation on one of the Alhambra tiles, and the idea is actually the, the three sides of this um, tile are musical notes, which are the octave and the perfect fifth. Um, but now we're looking at these plates to see whether we can create interesting patterns. So here's one uh, we just uh, started with, um, which is the same frequency on each plate, but already is creating an interesting kind of tessellation across the plane. Um, but our challenge is to kind of use this as a kind of tool um, to create a sort of musical version of the Alhambra, something which perhaps will be um, living and varying, almost like a musical instrument. Um, so uh, thank you for those who came this afternoon a little earlier to try and help us to explore these plates. Um, we're going to be taking this to the Cheltenham Science Festival, so if any of you are around in Cheltenham, we're going to be there for the whole weekend just playing with our plates and seeing what symmetries we can make out of sound. Thank you.